Sanctuary, Being Christian in the Wake of Trump, written by Heidi Newmark, narrated by Tanya Eby. I don't know what the future holds for this country. I don't know whether the causes of liberation and freedom will continue to unfold in the mysterious ways that they have been. I don't know whether the hand of a providential God will once again break into human history. Simply put, I don't know whether salvation is coming for America. I often wonder, is the project of America even worth saving? Is the often maligned, abused, denied, policed, hijacked, and deferred American dream even worth dreaming? I also don't know whether this criminal administration in the White House at the time of my writing this foreword will win another election. But I have to ask, does it even matter? The rampant white supremacy, systemic and structural racism, weaponization of executive privilege and orders, and intentional legislative harm to communities of color have been here long before Trump. I'm not even sure whether the next election matters as much as the revelation that, in a lot of ways, this is who we are as a country. This is us at our core. This is what the Republic is now a bloated empire with no regard for its citizens, pitting those who don't know they are in a cage against those at once in a cage. In the question of what came first to the White House, white supremacy or Donald Trump, the answer is obvious in his rise. Herod didn't create the throne of Israel. He sat in it. In the same way, Donald J. Trump, the 45th president of the United States of America, didn't create systemic racism and 400 years of oppression. He was baptized in it. From gorging himself at the trough of end-stage capitalism at his birth to wielding the outsized influence that celebrity culture gave him most his life, he is truly American in his rise to the greatest office in the land. That rise was built on the backs of the very poor, empowered by the wealth of others, and filled with overt acts of hatred. I don't know what the days ahead will hold, or where we will be as the people of God by the time you read this, but I do know Heidi Newmark and the people of Trinity Lutheran Church in New York City. I do know that in the early days of this administration, they did public acts of church and liturgy that were resistance. I do know that as a leader in the church, Heidi spoke sharply and clearly. She didn't equivocate or negotiate with evil. She named a thing what it was when many others in the church were too busy worrying about congregational backlash and retirement planning. Maybe that is a product of the incredible community she serves. Maybe it's because queer bodies are held sacred in Trinity's sanctuary walls and sheltered in its basement. Maybe it's because, like a sower, Heidi has been spreading the kingdom of God wherever she goes, not worrying about what folks deem the best soil, the proper soil just throwing the seeds of new life everywhere she goes. That new life is a thing you can't bottle or recreate, but you know it when you come across it in the 21st century church, and you intuitively know it is precious, special, rare, and needs to be cared for and nurtured, that it has to be allowed to spread wild new life and growth to everything it touches. The author and pastor and the community you are going to meet in these pages are all those things. If you are looking for hope, respite, courage, and a draft of the water of life, then you have come to the right place. You see, there are people who have labored long and wearily in this cause. There is a ragtag army ready to wage peace on the world and turn back the tide of oppression sweeping this country and, by proxy, the American church. It is rising up. Thankfully, some of those joining its ranks are Heidi and the community she serves. May the author's words bless you. May the stories within speak to the tender places inside you. May you find sanctuary in the current raging storm. May you still find ways to look through your own brokenness and beyond your neighbor's brokenness to the imago dei in us all. In the name of the parent, the rebel, and the spirit. Lenny Duncan 17 Autumnal Saints I believe that there's a change in weather, and I think it changes both ways.
Throughout the year, the church devotes a number of days to celebrating saints. People the church believes have lived especially holy lives, third-century martyrs Perpetua and Felicity on March 7, 12th-century Benedictine nun Hildegard of Bingen on September 17, a Christian mystic, composer, poet, scientist, physician, and herbalist, Bartolome de las Casas on July 18, a Dominican missionary who wrote to expose the oppression and torture of indigenous peoples by Europeans in the Americas and to call for the abolition of slavery there. Not all saints are centuries old, of course, or famous for overtly churchy accomplishments. Florence Nightingale's Saints' Day is August 13. We Lutherans don't believe that saints were perfect people. In the Bible, when St. Paul writes letters to young churches, he addresses his letter to the saints in Rome or to the saints in Corinth, and reading the letters makes it clear that these saints were not sinless people, nor was St. Paul. In these letters, saints refers to people beloved of God, people who belong to God, though they are flawed. We are all sinners and saints, but we do recognize that some people lived with singular holiness. Despite their failings, we can learn from their faith and from the shape of their lives. Some of these saints are hidden to all but a handful. Every church has their own local list, and every person may have their own private list, but others are known to millions. On All Saints Sunday, many churches remember those who have died, especially those most dear to us. For All Saints at Trinity, we cover the altar with a white cloth and have a bowl of markers for people to write the names of their deceased loved ones on the altar cloth. We do this to remember that the communion of saints is present with us as we celebrate Holy Communion. All Saints Sunday falls on the first Sunday in November, the same day as the New York City Marathon. This convergence strikes me as sheer serendipity. On All Saints Sunday, we hear a reading from the book of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I like to think that the saints who have already crossed the finish line of their lives remain close to us, behind sight, cheering us on our way. At Trinity, we also try to lift up saints from this cloud of witnesses throughout the year, including queer saints, African-American saints, female saints, Latinx saints, and every autumn, our calendar gives us a trio of widely known saints. St. Francis, October 3, St. Luke, October 18, and St. Martin of Tours, November 11. St. Francis is perhaps one of the most popular saints. Many places around the neighborhood do not allow people to hang signs with any religious content, like the local library that understandably must remain nonpartisan, except when it comes to St. Francis. I cannot post invitations for neighbors to attend Sunday worship. However, even the library will make an exception if my flyers invite people to accompany their pets for a blessing as we celebrate St. Francis. The library happily promotes the blessing of pets, just not people. We can hang flyers everywhere for St. Francis, but not for St. Luke or St. Martin or any other saint I can think of. Francis is such a favorite, I think, because he was known to love animals. Birds and wolves were said to listen to him when he preached, to care about ecology, and to pursue peace. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, runs a prayer attributed to St. Francis. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is despair, hope. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, for it is in giving that we receive. Francis has wide fandom. As a patron saint for the environment, the one place that may not welcome Francis is the White House. As a first-round presidential candidate, Trump dismissed climate change as a hoax invented by the Chinese. After becoming president, he picked Scott Pruitt, a man who rejects the role of carbon dioxide in climate change and has stated that if the planet does warm, it may help humans flourish, to head the Environmental Protection Agency. Under Pruitt, EPA scientists were not permitted to share any scientific findings related to climate change with the public. All such data was for internal use only. One scientist at the EPA wrote, 
the constant attacks on science and facts by the current administration has negatively impacted scientists in the agency. Effects range from anger and frustration to depression and even opting to retire early. 25 years of experience with three federal agencies and I've never seen anything like this. It is appalling. So, when planning our annual St. Francis celebration, it seemed like a good idea to highlight Francis's care for the Earth and to include our resident scientist in the planning. Emily took out time, in the final days of preparing her Ph.D. defense, to write The Scientist's Lament for our liturgy. On the day of the celebration, we blessed animals outside, invited everyone, including pets, inside, and began worship with Emily's Lament, which reads in part... You might have heard of the panda, the gorilla, leopard, the emperor penguin, the manatee, the rhino. But have you heard that 26,000 species are threatened with extinction? Have you heard that 41% of insects have declined in just 10 years? And at the current rate, none will be left at all in a century? Birds will starve, lizards will starve, fish will starve. Have you heard that 3 billion birds have disappeared from North American skies over the past 50 years? 30% of birds are already gone. We'd hung a dozen colorful cardboard birds from strings between the columns in front of the altar. As Emily read, another congregant stepped forward with scissors and cut the birds so that they slowly fell, one by one, to the floor around the altar. As they fell, I realized that we had made a mistake printing out the scientists' lament because many people had their heads down reading along as Emily spoke, not noticing the falling birds. Still, one person commented later that it shocked her to look up and see that the birds were no longer there, and then to notice them lying lifeless around the altar. Two weeks later, St. Luke's Day arrived. Luke wrote one of the four Gospels. Because St. Paul mentions in his letter to the Colossians that Luke is a physician, we associate him with medicine and healing. The hospital ten blocks from Trinity is one of many hospitals named St. Luke's. We commemorate St. Luke on the Sunday closest to his feast day with a healing service. In place of the sermon, I give a brief introduction to healing prayer and to St. Luke, and then the people walk around the church, reflect, and pray at any, or all, of ten healing stations that have been set up. We always provide an opportunity for the laying on of hands and anointing with oil, for placing votive candles on a map of the nations one wishes to pray for for attaching sticky prayer notes to a cross. Popular with children, but open to all ages, is a table with supplies to make cards for the sick. Outside the main doors, we hold a space to pray for those who have been hurt by the church and do not feel safe entering, and for those who are incarcerated. Other stations vary from year to year, depending on current events in the world and the preoccupations of the seminarians who help create the stations. Last year, our seminary fieldwork student, Alyssa, set up a station to help people consider what healing in relationship to disability means. The station explained ableism and included helpful information to guide people in considering ways they might heal the harm caused by discrimination against people with disabilities. In light of the escalation in murders of trans women of color, we covered a large cardboard cross with the now dead women's photos and names. 20 at the time of this writing in 2019. The cross stood next to an angel who held a bowl filled with slips of paper, each bearing these words from Psalm 139. I praise you, God, for I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Parishioner after parishioner stood before the cross and offered these words for themselves and for the 20 dead. In 2020, St. Luke's Day arrives a few weeks before the election. Our denomination has joined others in signing on to something called Golden Rule 2020, which invites us to pray for the healing of divisions in our country, and reads in part, We are Christians with different theological and political views, who have come together to express concern about the polarization and incivility that is tearing our country apart. We are also deeply troubled by the prospect of an angry and hateful political campaign season in 2020 that will further divide us as a nation. We believe that we can find guidance through this national dilemma in the teachings of Jesus. In particular, we believe that Jesus' command to do unto others as you would have them do unto you should be taken seriously by Christians who engage in political activity.
We also believe that if enough people follow this golden rule principle, it will help generate the respect and civility we so desperately need in our country. What kind of healing station might we create? I long for healing of divisions, but personally find the Golden Rule 2020 effort misguided. To my mind, we desperately need not to generate civility, but to overcome injustice and to relieve suffering, even though doing so might lead to increasing polarization. When the Trump administration has held nearly 70,000 children in detention facilities, civility is not what's called for. Martin Luther King Jr. heard a similar call for civility, demanding that he tone down his rhetoric and activism. I'd love to see the day when his response from the Birmingham City Jail has lost its relevance, but I don't expect to live that long. In his letter to white moderate clergy, King answered the complaints of those who prefer a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open, where it can be seen and dealt with. Like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed, with all the tension its exposure creates, to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. Perhaps our healing station will have a table spread with red cloth and blue cloth. We will place King's letter in the center and surround it with photos of the children who have died in detention centers and on the border. Or photos of lost trans women. Or photos of black men and women targeted for hate crimes more than any other group. How long, O oh Lord, we will cry with the prophets. Come, Lord Jesus, we will pray with the saints before us. On November 11, we arrive at the feast day of St. Martin of Tours. Trinity was founded by German-born Americans. Our baptismal font is engraved with the words, La set die Kindlein zu mir kommet. Let the children come to me. But, like most people in our nation today, when I hear about immigrants, I think of those who come from south of the border. In my first few years at Trinity, I assumed that though we might celebrate baptism in Spanish, or once in French, the parish's days of welcoming Germans were behind us. So I, the daughter of a German immigrant, was surprised when a few families whose jobs had taken them from Hamburg and Berlin to New York began to show up with their children in wee worship. Before long, I was doing baptisms in German. Just as immigrants from south of our border bring their foods and customs, so have these German families. And one of the more delightful traditions they bring is St. Martin's Day. Martin of Tours lived in the 4th century. His father was a soldier in the Roman army and named Martin for Mars, the Roman god of war. Imperial law required a son to take up the profession of his father, but Martin had begun studying for baptism and had no desire to fight. Nonetheless, bowing to paternal pressure, Martin postponed baptism and entered the Roman army. He was a model soldier, but he was not happy. One day, his troops passed by a barely covered poor beggar shivering in the winter cold. While his comrades rode on, Martin stopped his horse, took his sword, and cut his woolen cloak in two, wrapping the man in one half. That night, Martin saw Jesus in a dream dressed in the cloak. Martin, who is not yet baptized, has clothed me, said Jesus. When Martin woke up, he was determined to be baptized and told his superior that he could not continue in his regiment. Martin was imprisoned, but after a relatively short sentence, he did finally receive the sacrament of baptism, and he became a monk. Martin became known for his preaching in the countryside around the monastery, and for his kindness and generosity. The people wanted to make him their bishop, but Martin resisted, eventually having to hide from those who insistently sought after him. Supposedly, the noise of a gaggle of geese outside his hiding place led the people to him, and he finally relented. He became the third bishop of Tours, served until his death in 397, and was buried on November 11. Germans celebrate with a goose dinner, and children prepare lanterns, processing through the streets in search of Martin. At the end, the children receive cones of candy. At Trinity, we don't replicate the goose dinner, but we have enjoyed another German custom, baking and eating little St. Martin breads, which are like gingerbread men without the ginger.
We've also introduced our own St. Martin's Day tradition, based on Martin's encounter with the beggar. Beginning around Halloween, we collect coats, blankets, hats, scarves, and gloves. Before it grows too frightfully cold, we give them to the youth in our shelter and to those in need who attend our community Thanksgiving meal. But first, on the Sunday closest to November 11, we heap them around the altar in memory of St. Martin, whose kindness lives on here, as it might anywhere the baptized gather.